Hey everybody, I'm Terrence and welcome to uh, the illustrious On Floor Gallery. We're upstairs, uh, 1241 Good Hope Road. And this is the first of a series of just four events that we call Village Sessions, live from the village of Anacostia. And who better else to start it off than John Johnson. Um, and we're here uh, to just talk a little bit about what you've been doing, brother, before you go downstairs and do your thing. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It, it feels good to be the first. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, this is like the time capsule. This is like, you know what I mean? This is like anthropological as well as, you know, entertainment. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. So can I, can I just start just to paint a little, a little yeah, bit of a picture of what's going on? So, so today is technically the two-year anniversary of when coronavirus was officially called the pandemic. And so I just think this is important because, like, we've been living in Zoom boxes and, like, we're sitting here with our mask off because things are starting to begin to open back up, too. So I just want to talk a little bit about that transition as an artist. Like, you know, when the pandemic hit and they say that 10 people or more can't gather, you realize, like, that's the definition of an artist. We gather more than 10 people together and we kind of ask them for money to sustain whatever we're trying to do. My grandmother's and, funeral was in March of 2020. 10 people could only come. Right. Wow. So g gathering was out of the... Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. so folks had to be really creative. Yeah. And, you know, that whole, every artist became a broke artist. Like, even, even like, the legends was like, well, let's do... How can we do stuff on, on, right. on Instagram? Like, we, we really rely heavily on technology and you know, and um, just to make it through. Um, and and we've, we've actually, you know, figured out ways to use technology. You know, we've, we've figured out how to do what I do downstairs called playback theater on Zoom. But it was a very tough time where you, you weren't able to do the thing that you do, which is gather people down and give them your opinion or, or share with them. Sure. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that this is kind of, the, hopefully, the opening back up of art, the way that we kind of traditionally saw it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I just want to put that out there. Um, and w w one other thing that I just want to, I want to share with you, one of the things as an artist, though, that I just realized is like, um, you know, as I'm, I'm 42 years old, and, you know, sometimes, I'm, you know, when, I, when we talk to other artists, we, we always, like, compare ourselves generationally to other, you know, to the youngins and stuff like that. And we have a lot of, a lot of critiques of the younger generation. Um, but one of the things that, that me and one of my buddies uh, had a discussion about is like this generation is also the generation that's of naming things. And they name things that we weren't able to name before. So the example would be is, you know, like we talk about mental health. Like that's something that's like, what's mental health? Like, like what, what is a concussion? You know, I mean, these, these are all new terms within the last five or 10 years that we weren't even talking about. I mean, people may have mentioned them, but they, didn't, they weren't at the forefront of people's minds. So then when you put that lens on the people in the past, like what was Malcolm X's mental health like? What was Martin Luther King's mental health like after having their houses bombed? You know what I'm trying to say? Like, like and, when you, and when you look at it from that angle, you're like, they were probably absolutely out of their mind. Like, you know, he might even give them more credit for being able to go out and give a speech after knowing that your house was bombed. Or like, what were they dealing with internally? You know what I mean? If they weren't assassinated, what, what health issues might they have because they were holding on to so much? You know what I'm saying? So at least now, we're like, oh, mental health. There's therapy. We, we have different ways of counseling. And then that hopefully that then gets us to explore all the other colors that we weren't able to explore before because we were just trying to survive in oppression. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's, that's, that's kind of... And, and, and it leads into what we'll be doing this afternoon. I do something called Playback Theater. It's interactive storytelling where we don't know where the, what the stories are. You know, we just invite the community out. We have a, a, a wonderful actors who, who have studied improv and also improvisational musician. And we just re really reflect their stories back to them so that we can elevate their stories and have a community discussion around it, which is super therapeutic. It is very much, you know, yeah. especially yeah. in a time where we've been, in a, been in, indoors for two years trying to figure out ways to still have social interaction. So what was the inspiration for what you're doing downstairs? Um, well, I just, I'm just, I'm just nosy and intrigued by people. So you know, this this gives the opportunity, as well as like, you know, oftentimes we we idolize celebrities, like whether it's Barack Obama, Donald Trump, or the Kardashians. Everyone's fascinated with them. Like, but if you ask people, you know, if they had a life or death story, everybody's had one. Whether whether they 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 they've gotten over some you know severe health issue or 
or whether or not they were, weren't paying attention on their iPhone or almost got hit by a car. You know what I'm saying? But that, you know, and it just let us, lets us know we all human beings. We all pass gas and fart, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you know what I mean? But like, you know, oftentimes we, 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 we kind of have this kind of positioning that takes place unconsciously. But like when you sit in a room full of people and anyone has the opportunity to get up and be the star, mm-hmm. it, it just changes the paradigm of things that already are curated. Mm-hmm. But this sounds a lot like what you're doing with the, uh, the Anacostia the map. map. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, did that play a role in leading you here? Because it sounds, you know, letting people tell their stories, it sounds a lot like what that project was about. Yeah, so Anacostia Map was like an oral history project where mm-hmm. I, I interviewed a lot of um, residents in Anacostia in the Hillsdale area over the age of 65. And it was for a radio program. And so what happened was I did these like 45 minutes, some two hour interviews. And you know, we tell them up front, like this interview may end up on the radio. And so, you know, I interviewed maybe like 40 people, but we only used about seven interviews. And then they, they you know, the radio is not going to play a two hour interview. So they, you know, at, at the max, some people might have gotten seven minutes. And so then, you know, so there were a whole bunch of people like, well, my, my story, you interviewed me, my story wasn't on. And I, then the folks whose story was on was like, you only showed seven minutes of my story. I'm like, oh, so, so, so playback was definitely a, a alternative to soothe that, that kind of like not being seen. So I invited all of the folks. Who, who had their interviews. I gave them their own copy of their interviews so they could pass it down to the future generations. And then we asked them to tell stories. So not only they got to tell stories, but their children got to tell stories. And then they felt satisfied and seen, you know, as opposed to like, and, I, and you know, there's an issue right now where comedians are having the same issue. You interviewed all these comedian friends and they all upset that the, that the Netflix special for an hour doesn't give them more time. It's like, man, I interviewed a hundred of y'all. Like, like, it's gonna be edited down. You know? Like, you can't, you know, so. You know, one of the things that I find interesting about that is just having worked, uh, you know, in this, in this block for, for the amount of years that I have, I've seen people come from like different places, maybe grad programs and this and that. And it's like almost like every year, a cycle of uh, people coming to want to like document, you know, People in Anacostia and, and sort of like, how, but but often it feels like a fishbowl kind of effect. And so to see you doing it because what is blatantly evident is your heart and where your heart is in this. You know, and this is this is something that like you know off the break just sets it apart from any of like. I, I feel like you're just tuned in to a lot of nuances that um, some someone that you know, and all all intentions aside. But I just even if even if, if even if someone with the most sincere pure intentions, you know, uh, it was like I want to just kind of chronicle and just kind of you know hear the stories of people from you know from from this village. I call it a, it's a village, you know. Um, there's still something that hits different about. You because you got boots on the ground and you had it. Oh, thank you, thank you, Terrence. But you know, I, I, I want to you, you, thank you, thank you for that, that that compliment. And it's interesting you say that because in learning oral histories, I was trained in how to capture oral histories, and oftentimes their training is to bring you into this like sterilized place and then ask you questions. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's the way traditional oral historians are, they, they take you out of your environment bring you to some special place and they record and then they ask you all these questions. Well, when they when they, they kind of taught me that narrative, you know, like two things happened. One, it was like the snow apocalypse. And some of the people who who's who I interviewed, I was shoveling their snow. Okay. You know what I mean? And then they invited me into their homes with the tape recorder so I can see the pictures on their walls right. and smell the turkey bacon. So when I'm asking you a question, you can be like, oh well that's my, my, my ex-husband right there on the wall. You know what I mean? Like like even it's different getting an interview in someone's home than it is taking them out and maybe interviewing them on your turf or in your, they don't, you know, where they can pull up pictures and they got stuff on the wall, they can go and pull out jewelry and things like that. And it helps them be way more detailed and relaxed and honest about things. So, I mean, I think it's twofold. One is like the, the way that people are kind of trained and the other one is like interview people in their own spaces because that, that allows the people to be honest and very transparent. Kind of your passion for language and storytelling comes from. I mean, I know you've got your own company. You know, you have the event downstairs. I know you've written a book. 
Um, so words and just communication and you talk about gathering seems so central to who you are. So I'm just wondering like what kind of sparked that? Um, I mean, once you learn what these 26 letters can do, <laughs> you know, you got to use them, you know, use them to get out of fights. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You can use them to make people angry and want to fight. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, these words kind of, like, words Words have this, like, this power. And, you know, when I was coming up, I'm like, I'm, even, I'm, I'm dyslexic. So I'm like, I don't, I'm like, I'm like, who put the D's and B's so close? Like, who? They're too close. They look too much alike. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I remember in school, like, I was I was always in the, um, the lowest reading class, but I was always in the highest math class. And I remember the lowest reading class, you know, everybody was in there like, yo, these D's and B's, the people, you know, we were all struggling. And you could tell that some people use humor because they knew the, you know, it was coming around their time, it was coming around to read, so they either crack some jokes or they, they throw a temper tantrum. It's like, oh, these are all things that people are doing in order to, to but the class is very lively. <laughs> you know what I mean? The reading class is very lively and full of storytelling because, because then all of the students compensated for doing something else. While the math class is also, you know, very competent kids who, you know, who knew structure and things like that. So it's like, if you marry the two of those together, then you're like a whole human being, you know what I mean? So I knew an MC who was dyslexic, and the way he compensated is his freestyle. You, you, you could barely tell the difference if he wrote it or not. Because we used to be like, why don't you write the thing, you know? But he wasn't really letting on, we sort of discovered that. He could go in the booth and he'd say something, he'd be like, that's dope, but say something else. He'd go in and say something else. He, he, and that was his compensation. Right. And, and that, that makes memory, your memory has to be stronger. If you, you, if, when you hear something, you have to remember it. Like, and it really depends on who, you know, it's, it's interesting even when you talk about like colonization and stuff like that. Like the written word is how they colonized, you know, they said, hey, they gave some Native Americans something, got them to sign, sign off on it, and like, I got this document. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on who is the leader of, of what's, what intelligence is. Because someone who has a photographic memory is actually, we, we all honor somebody who's like, who can hear something once and remember it forever. You know what I mean? Like, we, we consider that a strength. So griots, uh, you know, a lot of folks in African culture would be considered geniuses because they remember lineages of people through stories and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. While, while somebody can technically say the written word is lazy because then you can forget about it and bring it up whenever you want. You know what I mean? Right. So it really depends on who, how you value what people's strengths are. Right. You know what I mean? Because I think yeah. everybody has, you know, gifts and assets in that in that realm because we're all trying to survive and we have to communicate. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, you know. I was struck by how when you, when you did the uh, talk back to me and I just, you asked me a few things about myself and, and what I didn't know is that your cast was like on record. And so, like I just said, you know, I teach Qigong, I did this, he asked me about what, what, what happened over the last couple of years, like what's sort of in the forefront of my mind. And then, these people just interpret, like they gave it back to me in an interpret, and I, no one's ever done that to me before. Like no one's ever, I was like stunned at what the takeaway was from what I put out and what was brought, it, it, was, it was like, it was like, it was like uh, feedback, you know, like, like, like literal feedback, like in, you say something to a mic and the thing and then you get that, it was like that. Yeah, and it's called playback theater. We literally are giving yeah. you right back what you yeah. And it's because people don't feel seen. Like a lot of times, if you ever talk, I, I'm sure everybody has friends who whenever they talk to you, they're super intense. Sometimes it's because they don't believe that you, you really hear them. Like, man, jump. I'm telling you, man, this happened the other day. I was out there in the street, man. And you, you'd be like, why are you? It's like, because they also say, like, I don't feel heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and so we, we live in a society that doesn't take time to see people and to hear you. So this art form is really like, you have the stage, you can tell us whatever's on your mind, your heart, your spirit. We're going to listen to it, and we're going to show you that we're listening. You know what I mean? Like, that's, 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 that's what it is, and it just feels so good because oftentimes we don't. Everything's so, so quick. You, you, if, you get, if you get an opening, you better hurry up and say it, and you better be mm -hmm. concise, and be able to hit people so hard. And that's sometimes why we're so aggressive. Like, cause I gotta say this to make you, so you understand clearly what I'm saying because we don't have a whole hour to sit down and, and talk about why I feel this way. And before you go downstairs, 
because I, I feel the energy down there already. Um, would you tell us how to reach you? Like, what are you doing now and how, how people can find you? Okay, so you can, you can reach me at, at verbalgymnastics.com. Um, uh, what I'm currently doing is I'm launching a youth troop, which is 24 years old and to 18 year olds um, in Anacostia. We're gonna because you know we, we, the playback troop we have now they, they're wonderful, they're amazing, they have a whole bunch of history. Um, but we did a Father's Day show in Southeast, and everybody thought it was wonderful. And one of the critiques was like, "Man, that was good." But I wanted to see somebody who's 24 like me. The guy who was telling the story, he wanted to see, you know, when you tell a story, you want to see yourself. You know what I'm trying to say? You know, like, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I always say, like, you know, when people play to Jesus, who you pray to, black Jesus or white Jesus? You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I, I say that to challenge, like, the narrative of why we see, you, you know, you want God or, or God, I mean, God is a woman to me. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, um, you know, you want to see yourself in whatever you, you believe in. And so, you know, it, it gave me the impetus to, to launch this youth troop because some of the issues that I think we, we are discussing, it'll be nice for that, that group of young people to have have this form and they can see themselves in some of the you know the lessons that this generation is actually trying to trying to conquer. All right, well, we're gonna follow you downstairs. All right. Jason, hey, So the question is, how have you gotten through these times? 
So how, how did you get these times? Can you just say, say, well, so you, so you remember the times when you had friends that what? Um, they're like, they're like, there are times when I had friends, and those were just pretty good times, and there are times when I felt pretty bad, but I realized that there were still really good times when it was a lot of Okay, but I'm saying, so for over these two years, how, how did you interact with your friends? And, you know, did, and, 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 this, and during these times when folks had to wear masks, and we were out of school for a moment, like, what? What other ways did you did you find to interact with the people and, and, and say you say friends? Well, there's kids around where I know some of these apartments with my dad and there are kids there. I don't really call them friendly, but my dad would make like my dad's a pretty good friend. Like he really helped me a lot and like really does help me. So your father was your friend? Yeah. Okay, and what 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 types of things did you and your dad do that that, that you that that stand out to you in the story that you tell us? Well, we got the Legos, we got the PS4. Legos, PS4, what else? David Busters. David Busters? <laughs> Did y'all have a mask of David Busters? Uh, no, he told me that he didn't have a mask of David Busters. Oh. He didn't have one Oh, okay. And David Busters. And Virginia? <laughs>
had to kind of like, when you fight in it before, you're like, you know what, it's, it's okay to be. Like, can, can you give us a little, a little bit of context of, of like, there's a lot of expectations and, you know, a, a mother and somebody with a job and family in particular will always be kind of final. So just say, I'm going to take a walk by myself and deal with that just with the time uh, and taking that space from my daily life is a little bit more central for my life. So just walk so with this walk that you took when you said, you know what, I'm gonna put down being a mom or working a job. What what what, what job did you, did you work? I'm a college professor. A big being a professor. And you took this walk. Where 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 did you take this walk? Um I walked around my neighborhood and just really got to explore every street and every corner and every alley. Okay, where where where, where is this community? In, in Baltimore City. In Baltimore City. So you walked around Baltimore City and you got, did you, what, can you tell us something that you may have discovered when you were able to put down all of those responsibilities and you want to get walking? That um, paying attention to things that are inconsequential and small can be really beautiful. So finding beauty where you don't think it exists. But like what? Like what, 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 what's something that you saw that was beautiful that you, that you were able to see? For example, how a, a street light falls on a glass pavement and how beautiful backyard trash can be. How beautiful backyard trash? <laughs> the street lights fall on the glass pavement, how beautiful backyard trash can be. I'm a photographer, so light is, is uh, this is something I pay attention to all the time, so discovering that was, was kind of something that took Okay, and tell us your name? Elena. Elena, so on the counter, we're going to do a three car story, we're going to go Aaron down. We're going to say Elena, let's watch, all right? One, a four car story. Sorry, four car story. Elena, let's watch. One, two, three. Okay. Elena, let's watch.
There's a wind that's blowing through your hair and your body right now. I'm so glad that you can hear it and feel it and see it. I'm with you. So if you would like to be one of those people to have a conversation with her once this is all said and done. Cool. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Who else has a story they want to share about how they've gotten through? Yes. Well, it's so interesting. But I, for one, um, truly enjoyed the pandemic. I'm in a different situation. <laughs> so you enjoyed it. Why, why did you enjoy it? Uh, I enjoyed it because I uh, learned my whole I moved into my home uh, one year before the pandemic. Uh, I just moved, it was a hotel. I was just in and out, working in the time house, but mostly working. So I got to know my home. So as I got to know my home, I rearranged <laughs> my kitchen cabinet because I realized, oh, it's better to have the cutlery here near the sink and the spoons and the stuff that I put with near the stove. I then also organized my closets. Like I went to a minimalist at my style. I organized my basement. I'm so happy to have a golden alley in my basement. I hate stuff. A golden alley? I don't have a golden alley. Oh, you don't have a golden alley? It's, 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 it's okay. actually a golden alley yes, because it's very empty and everything has a spot in the basement okay. that I've not created a new gym for myself. But I still have space to hang out. Um, I learned my neighborhood. Um, when I moved in, um, I was like, I'm a I'm scared. But I started walking from my home to that Aussie park. And I was like, oh, this one is amazing. And then I continued on and I discovered River Terrace. And I continued on and discovered Kettleburg Park. And then I started biking. <laughs> um, the first time I went to the park, and then I started biking you know, on the path and then on the road. And now I no longer drive. I officially just bike and scratch public transportation. I also discovered I love cooking. I mean, I cook in the for myself. <laughs> um, I'm doing pandemic and I love it. It's fun meal planning and for more money. People plan it as like I go to the store and be like, what am I gonna eat today? What do they have to stop? <laughs> so I'm gonna go to the store maybe three times a day. I love I guess I hate I never was a work from home person. Love working from home. I can go on and tell me stop. No, no, okay, let's 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 do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're gonna do it for a day. So we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do that last four part story. But this is this is a different perspective. That's why it's good to have community conversations. Like, you know, the pandemic, we definitely had a lot of loss, but we've also discovered things, and then we have more time. You mentioned having this relationship with your home. And organizing now you're there you can go to drawers and you know your your forks exactly. and spoons are, have a home. You said you went through this minimalist thing, you had this, you discovered the community more, Anacostia Park Cameron Avenue. So if you had to give a title to this this these this, this series of things you learned during this pandemic, what would your title be? Year of Abundance, or Two Years of Abundance. Two Years of Abundance. And tell us your name? Juliana. Juliana, on the count of three, we're going to say, we're going to do a solid on down. We're going to say, let's watch. On the count of three, we're going to say, Juliana, let's watch. One, two, 
three. Juliana, let's watch. You got an accent. You wake up positively. But make a negative latch on. To be affirmative, no matter the mister in between.
patient once a day, and everyone travels with me for me. With COVID, I have never felt more secure. I came to this country six years ago, and I came on a program for my country to identify age because I have a disability where here they were doing study for drugs that we did not have and I was of an age where most girls in my country said that I didn't have kids. But I was in I was a fool at the time. I have asked the first for my parents. They and they always done they assisted me with making choices for my life to where I could live and live well in spite of my disability. So I came here and it was quite difficult until COVID because it's different with a type of autism when people see autism, they usually have one view or one perception. And no one's perception ever has to be in your reality. My parents taught me. So I learned to have things that can be comfort. And my comfort is since I was in there, has been my background. Course. And when I first got here, I lived on campus at GW, and that gave me small comfort because I felt established because I was doing the felt things out in the world and defying odds. But it was not until COVID that I felt welcome and relieved for three reasons. Not I come from an Islamic country where most of our women and our men are public. So for the first time, for the first time I felt like a world that has choices and freedoms and sometimes seems very disrespectful of honorable things like religion and culturalism because America has so many so many ways for you to be free that I feel like people disrespect the things that should bind us together. And I took small comedy in the fact that, okay, at least now they know what it's like to just around, walk just around looking like a peacekeeper because I got peace for it. And I felt like it brought humbleness to so many people because when you only show your eyes, there's so much more that people learn from expression and so many more things that are taken away. So you start to pay attention to a voice. And with Asperger's, people don't even know that in social situations, especially, we don't make eye contact or outside of the bank, it's very hard for us. Did I give you three? Because when I walked in, I was so doubtful that it took me like 20 minutes. I even made plans with my neighbor to walk home with her because I know it would be really rough for me. And it wasn't until you spoke to me that I heard your voice and it made me look up and grab myself with someone I knew to give me that comfort because he comes by my yard where I'm at my most peaceful with his dog. And the second thing COVID made me realize is that people respected personal space. And I was just speaking to my neighbor today. I said, I prefer my dogs to most humans because they know what respectful space means. And I've always had issues with personal space and people, especially in America, because most Americans who haven't been outside of America, they say, oh, I do this because it's normal. Oh, I do this, it means respect. 
when they haven't been exposed to other cultures and other worlds, they don't feel like they're being disrespectful or making you uncomfortable. The third thing COVID made me appreciate is that it brought out, as both of these made me see the sadness that I feel every day of my life, that most people take for granted and don't even realize they have never felt from the containment because they've never been contained and they have such beautiful words. So eloquently expressed about the warmth you feel in your home. My home, wherever it just happens to be, and I've lived in four countries. Your home speaks to you. The scent, the sounds, even something as small as a creaking floorboard welcomes you and comforts you. And COVID made people have to adjust their lives to live with senses that most people don't indulge in expressing with where, and I shared with John recently, I don't think he knew, I didn't speak until I was 10, and sign language of my first language, Tuxeda, and Hebrew were my second and third. And I'm not sure if it's because of the way I was born or trying to move to different countries from a young age, going to Germany when I was tiny, tiny for healthcare and things that, you know, weren't being done in my country to assist people when people were just being aware of the vast range of autism and things, but I had to learn to always adapt, and even with emotions, people telling me I didn't have them because I didn't respond the way not atypical people respond. So even today, both with my neighbor across the street, Miss Carolyn, and she says it doesn't matter if you have to cry the whole way through. At least you showed up and you made it through. And it doesn't matter if you don't feel how others feel the way they do you too. So show up and get through it. And that's how I spent most of my life. But with COVID-19, I grew. And I learned how to evolve verbally in a way that all before I had never had to do. So TK, yeah. I just I want I want I want to honor your story. Awesome. No, 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 this is Thank fine. Thank you for cutting. Yeah, no, 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 it's good. So, so we're going to do a narrative view, and we'll have um Reverie at the front of the narrative view. What is your What is your country? You say your country. It was Turkey, Turkey, Ashana, and from the very southern most part of Turkey. The southern part of Turkey. Okay. And if you were to give the the story a title that you share with us, what title would that? Progression, progression through containment. Progression through containment. So I just want to say, I want force to say, containment. Force, it's different. force containment. Progression through force containment. So I'm going to make people be vulnerable, um, and you're going to see your, your story play back in the narrative view. And can you tell everyone your name? Patricia Tagliasi, or everyone calls me TK. Okay, so we're going to say TK, let's watch. All right? Everyone can get the form of the narrative. Thank you, Jeff. No problem, no problem. Can you just back up just a little bit more so, so TK can see? All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. TK, let's watch. This is TK's story. I have never been seen as someone who was whole, who could feel, who could be.
in America. Amen. People are so inhumane. Rude. But COVID COVID slowed everyone down. COVID forced everyone to limit themselves. Limit. Limit, limit themselves to a form. form. Put guardians up so they could see each other. I want to laugh so much. <laughs> they have to see each other. See each other. I have felt more comfortable in this country with COVID than I ever had. So, what gave you the bravery to go out and ride the bike when, you know, there was so much fear about this pandemic at the beginning? So, what, what was, what was well, a, I, diff a different... I don't think it was that much fear. I didn't, I never felt, never felt afraid. Okay. I've never been a fearful person, and I've never been a stupid person. <laughs> so, I mean, fear comes from a lot of just stupidity because you don't think you have control over what affects you. And I know I have control over what affects me. I've always ate right. I've, I've never had a flu. I've never taken a flu shot. You know, and I live by myself in a, in a place. So from a scientific perspective, it was very unlikely that I would catch anything except uh, a cold. Uh, so I'm just saying that it was nice. I lived, by, I lived uh, close to Howard on George Avenue. And it was just so nice that I could just walk down George Avenue Nobody, no cars would be running, especially that first first year. I could just I could just do almost anything I wanted outside and I spent most of my time outside. Okay, and, 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 and so explain to me, so 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 2019 was great. So before 2019, what was life like? Paint a picture of what life was like before before. It was, before. Hectic. It was noisy. 
It was noisy. It was crowded. It was, crowded. It was smelly. It was smelly. Okay. Um, it was dirty. It was dirty. 2019 could have a lot of that. And so, and so now, what is life like? So it's like the same now? It's getting back to American normal. <laughs> and so back to being smelly and dirty, crowded. And dirty. People killing each other. People killing each other. Politicians lying. Politicians lying. So it seems like it's going back to. Taxes going up. You know, taxes going up. You know, prices, you know. Okay. It's, it, was, it was such a. It was such a it reminded me of the times in D.C., I don't know if you remember that, uh, 10 years ago, they had that big snowstorm, Snowmageddon, mm -hmm. and everything was shut down, and I would go out and just walk up the streets, and the big snow piles on the side with, with the trucks would come with the clouds, and I could just walk down the middle of the road, and I would be like the only person, and I would go out at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was just so nice. Okay. Just so nice. Jabari, pick someone to play you in the story. <laughs> uh, I don't know who you, 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 you just know. You, you point point to who, who just just it's your choice. I would four actors just point to someone to play you. You. Three words? Mm -hmm. Give me three. Just three words? Just, just three. You gotta, you gotta give, give me three words to describe Jabari. The three words I would pick for other people. You. <laughs> you. Pick, pick the one that you would pick about yourself. Uh, well, my name is Jabari. I pick my name. I'm Jabari Swahili for Brave and Fearless. That's, uh, that's definitely me. Okay. Um, my last name is Zakia, which is a female Swahili first name, which means intelligent. So that's definitely me. And uh, uh, very socially conscious. Very so. What does very socially conscious mean? To me, it means understanding. Your place in society, how you got here, why you're here, and what you're supposed to do while you're here. Okay. All right. So, so you you told a story about how 2019 was wonderful. It reminds you of snow again because while everyone else was in their homes, you got to actually explore this world without it being smelly and and all of the things, the ills of what we consider normal was. You know what I mean? And, and you, you've taken your time to ride your bike. You got to explore these parks. You said you and the squirrel yeah. being in the park. And that was it. Are you walking down Georgia Avenue? No one's in Georgia Avenue. Okay. All right. So if you could give a title to the story you just shared with us, what would the title of that story be? Um, a small window of freedom. A small window of freedom. So on the count of three, we want to say Jabari, let's watch. One, two, three. Jabari, let's watch. Thank you. 
He's the best nuts. I'm so glad that you're out here, you know. Nobody ever understands these nuts that I get. And I, I bury them all over this place. And I'm so glad nobody's around. I can just eat nuts now. You want some? No, you man. Want some? I, 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 you okay? Oh, wait, I've got, I've got so many nuts around you, you wouldn't believe it. People, you can never find them. That's like, Brad, let me stay right there. Okay, all right, all right. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm not going to touch you. I'm and I tell touch you what, you. I'm going go on over here. Okay, all right. right. Understand? Hey, no, no, no. One, one love, one love. Good to see you. One love, brother. One love. I told you I'm in trouble if I stay away from those people I'm unsure about. Maybe you did away. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, the 
Once there was a woman who lived in a country where people were too busy, too busy, and too rude, and didn't stop to see each other. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.